Despite only being a few million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs, the early Cenozoic saw a rapid expansion in both the diversity and the general size of mammal groups worldwide. This in turn led to a new age of giants. There were the early ancestors of animals such as elephants and rhinos, as well as more unique megamammals such as Hypercorifidon and the members of Dinosaurata, a group we've covered before on this channel. But this list of megafauna would be incomplete without mentioning the Brontotheres. Brontotheridae was a group of large ungulates that are widespread throughout the Eocene. Brontotheres came in a variety of shapes and sizes, with some members lacking horns and others sporting quite impressive ones. There's a clear sign that these animals grew in size as the Eocene progressed. Though these animals started out small, they grew in size until they reached elephantine proportions. Brontotheres, unlike many of the mammals we've covered so far from the early Cenozoic, actually have a well-documented and rich fossil history to look at. Brontotheres are part of Perissodactyla, or the odd-toed ungulates, a group that also includes rhinos, tapirs, and horses. From a first glance, the body plan of a brontotheer gives off an uncanny resemblance to large modern herbivores like rhinoceroses. However, they're actually much more closely related to horses, and early hornless members do look extremely similar to them. Interestingly enough, this also lines up with the views of the Native Americans who were present around the regions where brontotheer fossils were found. These people referred to the bones of brontotheres that would show up after storms as those of a thunder horse. Like we said before, while they weren't exactly horses, they were surprisingly close in terms of taxonomy. They're also the reason why brontotheres got their names, literally meaning thunder beast. The earliest member of Brontotheridae was once considered to be a small North American ungulate known as Lambdatherium. While this genus is no longer included in the group, it's seen as the closest relative to Brontotheres among other perissodactyls. The earliest true member of Brontotheridae is actually Eotitanops, which lived in North America and Asia. This creature was 45 centimeters or 1.48 feet at the shoulder, making it around the size of a small dog. It looked very similar to early ancestors of tapirs, rhinos, and horses and this general body plan and morphology was extremely common in early perissodactyls. Another early brontotheer was the North American Paleosiops. This animal is a bit bigger than Eotitanops at 1 meter tall and 800 kilograms. The next stage in the evolution of the brontotheres came with the subfamily Brontotherinae. Although this was a more developed group of the family, early members still shared the basic morphology that animals such as Eotitanops had. In fact, these members wouldn't even get much bigger than early brontotheres like Paleosiops. One of these animals was the North American Mesaterinus, another genera that had no horn-like structures which only measured one meter tall at the shoulder. It wouldn't be until the evolution of the tribe Brontotherini that Brontotheres grew out of their shells as being cow-sized creatures barely over a meter tall at most and began to see a general increase in body size. This group also saw with it many members that had the horns that are a staple of this group. These include Prototitanotherium, present in both Korea and North America during the Middle Eocene, which saw a small protuberance on its head. The giant rhino titan of China evolved a bit later into the epic. In addition to having a horn, it also possessed an incredibly large nasal region. A European genera found in Romania known as Brachydiastomatherium carried on the trend of having exaggerated proportions. This brontotheria is known from fossils of its skull which indicate that in life it would have had an extremely long head. This is a trait shared by earlier brontotheres such as Dolichorhinus, but also seems to be the case with many other large Eocene ungulates such as the Dinocerat and Gobiotherium. This brontotheer, alongside its close relative Shiva Titanops, were also notable for being two of the only European brontotheer genera. All other members were only present in North America and Asia. The subtribe Emblotherina contained numerous different large brontotheer genera that were found in Central Asian countries such as Mongolia and Kazakhstan. One of the largest and by far the most famous among these brontotheres was Emblotherium. This was an incredibly large animal, standing at 2.5 meters or 8.2 feet tall and weighing 2,000 kilograms or 4,400 pounds. Beyond its size, the most striking feature of this beast was its bony structure at the front of its skull. Rather than looking like the horns of many other brontotheres, it instead had a ram-like plate, leading to the animal's name of battering ram beast. These ram-like morphologies were a staple of Emblotherina, although they were too fragile to be used as actual rams like the horns of extant animals like bighorn sheep. Brontotherina was the second latest grouping of brontotheres, and unlike Emblotherina, most of its members could be found in North America. The most famous member of this group, and the most famous of all the brontotheres alongside Emblotherium, was Megacerops. This beast was the largest of all brontotheres. It was as tall as Emblotherium at 8.2 feet, but could also clock in at over 3.3 tons in weight, almost 8,000 pounds. This animal had a unique set of horns positioned next to each other horizontally forming a Y-shape. Unlike with Emblotherium, where their play showed no differences between the sexes, here the horns were larger in males than in females. 
There are several physical characteristics of brontotheres that seem to be very similar to those of other related ungulates. One of these is their general build, which as we've stated earlier in the video, resembles horses for earlier members and rhinoceroses for later ones. However, there were also more subtle similarities. One is with the fang-like canines many members possessed, which could be used in self-defense but also in competition between males of the same species. This is actually a behavior we'll see in the one-horned rhinos today, who are also notable for possessing enlarged teeth, albeit those being their lower incisors. On the subject of teeth, one aspect of their dentition that sets brontotheres apart and is used to distinguish them from other perissodactyls are the unique W-shaped ridges on their molars. The horns of brontotheres such as Megacerops could have been used in similar ways to the horns of modern ungulates such as for defense and competition between males. In regards to the latter, there have been remains of Megacerops indicating broken ribs, and given that no other animal at the time could have had the size and power to inflict such an injury, it is likely that this was caused by the horns of another male of the same species. Like we've already mentioned, unlike the horns of other brontotheres, the plates of Emblotherium and others of its grouping were relatively fragile and as a result probably wouldn't be used as battling tools. Instead, scientists have attributed the purpose of the plates to many other reasons, two of the most prominent being as a display tool to attract mates and as a chamber that could be used to amplify the sounds of their calls. Brontotheres were known for being browsers, and their unique molars helped them in chewing plant matter. Brontotheres are mostly found on the continents of North America and Asia, but it's still unknown which one of these continents they evolved from. This is because the fossils of the early Brontotheres Eotitanops were both found in Pakistan and North America at around the same time. What is known is that multiple times throughout their evolution, they migrated from Asia to North America and back, likely through trans beringian connections. Brontotheres both emerged and died out at the end of the Eocene, with no member surviving into the Oligocene. Their extinction lined up with a major climate shift that occurred between the periods known as the Eocene-Oligocene climatic transition. While the Eocene was notable for being a much more tropical and hotter time for the Earth, with rainforest around the planet, the cooling that occurred at the end of this epoch brought about a major shift in the ecosystems of the world. What are once lush forests were replaced by grasslands and plains. This change did not bode well for the Brontotheres, who were browsers by nature and preferred a more forested habitat. Before wrapping this video up, I wanted to take some time to talk about the paleontological history regarding the discovery of the brontotheres. Brontotheres were first discovered during the mid-1800s where our understanding of taxonomy and how to properly distinguish different genera and species of animals was not as strong as it is today, so it led to many muddled classifications on the part of scientists at the time. One particular scientist of note was the researcher Henry Fairfield Osborne, who after being given specimens of several brontotheres went to work in determining taxonomy for the animals. Unfortunately, he was fairly shallow in determining how to split different brontotheres up, which led to numerous different species in genera, leading to 951 pages containing his findings. Despite the wealth of information he gathered, a lot of it was outright wrong. For example, he originally assigned what we now know today as Megacerops to 7 different genera and 37 different species, when there was only one genus with two species. Osborne also had some pretty goofy ideas when it came to the evolution of the brontotheres. He believed that the rapid evolution and the growth of their horns throughout the Eocene went beyond the bounds of natural selection, which while sounding extremely cool, is also blatantly false since the horns of brontotheres were always functional up until their extinction. He also believed that these animals went extinct due to what is known as racial senescence, where the animals eventually died out due to old age. Maybe I'm just a dummy, but this makes literally no sense to me. It's hard to fault him too hard though. If we were living, say, 200 years in the future, and you were to show me a fossil of a golden retriever and a pug, I'd probably assign them to different species based on morphology alone. Anyways, mistakes aside, Osborne is probably a really nice guy. I mean, look at the guy. He was an avid paleontologist, geologist, and- Oh. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a like, make sure to subscribe, and stay tuned for more uploads. Also, don't forget to recommend any video ideas you have for me in the comments below.